Greetings from Hopalong Hollow. This is Jerry. For several weeks now, I have been working and planning on a garden, a garden restoration, basically, on a side of the house that I rarely, rarely film. I am trying to create on this side of the house, in the midst of all the cottage gardens, what I call a more of a formal and symmetrical colonial herb and bulb garden. You really need to see the before pictures to really appreciate what I've done in here so far. And it still doesn't look like much. But this little section here is going to be that colonial herb and bulb garden. And the section is an 11 by a 14. So if you're interested in trying to make a garden like this, I highly recommend a book called Herbs. If you're not familiar with herbs and you don't really know what you want to plant. But the best way to show you what I'm doing here is to show you what I've done on paper and what I plan to do with all these items that I have. So what I'm aiming for, what my goal is, is to achieve something a little more formal, such as this garden right here. But besides using herbs, I also want to use spring bulbs so that before these herbs come in, the bulbs will be blooming. So I've used daffodils, tulips, and alliums in this garden as well. And where you see the sidewalk here in this garden, I used my bulbs, my daffodils, and my alliums to create those lines instead of using brick. If you're a gardener, you're probably in the habit of carrying a notebook around with you, and that's what I do as well. And this is my notebook that I even take out in the garden, so it gets pretty messed up. But I have been working on this design for this garden for a couple weeks before I actually have started to put it into um, reality. And I've really gotten quite far. In fact, I'm already just about this far with the exception of not getting some of this brickway and walkway laid. Now what I really want to concentrate on because the pergola already exists and this little garden down here already exists and this is a cottage garden right here and this is a shade garden right here. There are so many different climates in this little section. But what I'm concentrating on is this new herbal bulb garden. So 11 by 14 is my space. You can use any size you want. But my goal is to actually have, as I said before, something with more symmetry and a lot of mirror images instead of um, all the very informal cottage gardens that I have. I really want this smack in the middle of my cottage gardens. So right now I am still thinking about what sort of herbs I want to put in. So if you want to do something like this, your first goal is to actually lay your groundwork, which is basically mapping out your space or doing it on paper, or actually if you are able to out in your yard right now. We've had a couple uh, really warm days and I have been able to get out here every once in a while. But I really had to get those bulbs in and I found that this was a perfect place to put them because I was so late in getting my bulbs in. So right in the center, I've marked the planter. This is where I put Darwin Hybrid Pink Impression Tulips. And then along these two lines, I have planted huge daffodils and drumstick alliums all along here. This is going to separate my little sections for me and come up in the spring. And then as summer comes along and these uh, daffodils die down, the alliums will start growing here and I will still have my lines to delineate all these different sections. I recommend that you look for this book. You could probably find this uh, used on Amazon, Herbs. You will learn everything you need to know about herbs. Find out which herbs you want to grow. Okay, Liam, that's enough. And it'll give you a pretty good education. <laughs> so right now, we're in the planning stages as far as um, what to put in the garden. And, but I got the main thing laid out and that was the main project for today is to get this part laid out and get all my bulbs in. So finally, after having those bulbs for months and months and months, I was finally able to get them in. And it, it's fine here in East Tennessee. If you even put them in in February, they seem to do just fine. But I've laid out the section, 11 by 14. I've done a lot of the groundwork. Where the sticks are, that's where my lines are for my bulbs. That's They're already in. My tulips are already in. And this little dry creek runs along here. Sometimes it's dry, sometimes it's full. And right there is going to be my fencing. Because I will be putting a very short wattle fence around this. And these are just mulberry saplings that 
I get out of the field. I'm a little bit breathless because I've actually been working out here all day. It's getting dark even. And I really need to get in the house and clean up. And I need to prepare the table for our afternoon tea, which today we're having colonial tea to go with our colonial herb and bulb garden. And we'll be visiting this garden as I move along on it. And I hope that you will think about planting one as well. All you need right now is your notebook and a few ideas and maybe a book such as that or a book. Or there's another wonderful book called The Gardens of Colonial Williamsburg. You could also get a lot of information and inspiration from that book. So this is a pretty short gardening video, but we will be adding a lot more to it as the weeks go by. In the meantime, get some notebooks and make your plans and think about the herbs that you love. And if it's not too late for you to think about bulbs, think about the bulbs you might want to be putting in there. So we'll see you in the house. Okay, a view from the upstairs window. I can really check out my cemetery now. Looks pretty good, actually. The inspiration for doing a colonial tea party actually came from a question that I asked in one of my latest tea videos. And that question was, did anyone know of the continued existence of the tea trading company whose tea was dumped in Boston Harbor in 1773 and known as the Boston Tea Party and a pivotal turning point leading up to the Revolutionary War? Tea played a pretty important part in these events. So I really wanted to delve into the history of tea in America. So this is going to be a little bit of a, a brief history lesson in a nutshell, all about tea drinking and tea habits in America. One of the first things to recognize was that the colonists loved to imitate the customs of their English cousins. And in fact, it was noted in 1740 that, quote, the ladies here visit, drink tea, and indulge in every little piece of gentility to the height and temor 
and neglect the affairs of their family with as good a grace as the finest ladies in London. The colonists take tea at breakfast and again at three o'clock. In this, as in their whole manner of living, the Americans, in general, resemble the English. Well, that stands to reason, actually, considering the fact that so many of them were of English heritage. In the beginning, only the wealthy could afford the pleasures of tea, until the East India Tea Company changed all that and tea became the favorite drink along with coffee in the colonies. Tea became more affordable, easier to acquire, and there was not a family, even in the most remote cabins in Pennsylvania or South Carolina, that did not enjoy their tea daily. Now, Tea wasn't the only popular drink in the colonies at the time because not only tea, but also coffee and chocolate were very, very popular drinks. In fact, tea shops, coffee shops, popped up all over the colonies. And rather than going to a tavern where there were drunk drunkards <laughs> and a lot of goings on that uh, most families did not want to participate in, the tea shops and the coffee shops were a pretty safe place to be. Tea drinking was enjoyed by one and all, and this went on for quite a long time. But in 1767, something called the Townsend Act, which placed a duty on tea, and not just tea, but other imports, came into effect and the colonists called for a boycott on tea to show King George what they thought about his taxes. Now, many people did give up tea in, in America. And in fact, a Virginia woman in writing to her friends in England said this, quote, I have given up on the article of tea, but some are not so tractable. However, if we can convince the good folks on your side of the water the error of their ways, we may hope to see happier times. Well, unfortunately, happier times did not come. And on the evening of December 16th, 1773, a group of American colonists dressed as Mohawk Indians boarded British tea ships docked in Boston Harbor with the intent of destroying the tea on board. And this was one of those teas. These colonists were a group organized by a man named Samuel Adams. That was the brother of John Adams. And they called themselves the Sons of Liberty. And when the sons were finished, 342 chests of tea were destroyed. A clear message was sent to the English Parliament that the colonists would no longer tolerate unfair taxes, not just on tea, but on their colonies in any form. And this event, of course, this was called the Boston Tea Party. And it became, as I said before, a pivotal point in the American Revolution. So the question I had for the East India Tea Company, which is whose tea was dumped in the harbor, was what exactly were those teas? And the wonderful thing is that I actually found them. Um, fantastic. In a company right here called... Solstice Sea Traders is a tea sampler with six of the teas that were dumped in Boston Harbor. So we had Young Hyson and we have Lapsag Sushong. Of course, these are Chinese and I'm probably mispronouncing them. And we have Oolong. I love the sound of that. Oolong. Oolong tea. Yunwu green tea, a premium Kongu black tea, and China standard black tea. So we're going to try three colonial teas today, one of them being the Oolong. But I found another company selling tea. Oh, by the way, tea was often served in a tea chest like this. 
Now I found this old tea chest. This is just a reproduction tea chest. Probably not older than 30 or 40 years old, but it just so happened that all those wonderful little tea cans that I just showed you, and they actually came in this actually rather nice little box, very sort of authentic to the period, but they came in that little box and they fit perfectly in this tea chest. So the tea chest would have been served right on the table like this. You would open your tea like so and be able to either dip a little in your pot. Most likely it would be dipped in the pot. Your guests could choose the tea they wanted and they could even have their own separate infuser. So that's one set of tea. Another company which I really enjoy, these cans, number one, and these are also some of the original teas that were dumped into the harbor during the Boston Tea Party. This is Colonial Bohe, and the company is Oliver Pluff and Company from Charleston, South Carolina, Charlestown, South Carolina, known at the time, was one of the original 13 colonies. And this is a black tea blend, lightly smoky. This is one we're going to try today. And we're going to try some of the oolong from the Solstice Sea Traders. And this one I'm very excited to try because chocolate was also a very popular drink during this period. Chocolate tea was also very popular. And this cacao tea was Martha Washington's favorite tea, so I had to get this. And this is the one that uh, you and I really must try, chocolate shell infusion. So I cannot wait to try this. It's actually roasted cacao shells. So we'll see if it actually tastes like chocolate. If we add a little sweetener, and we might even want to add a little milk or cream to this tea. So this is a great one. I really want to try. An interesting note is that after the Boston Tea Party, John Adams, our second president of the United States and brother of Samuel Adams, who was pretty much in charge of the Sons of Liberty that actually dumped the tea into the harbor, John Adams wrote in his diary concerning the Boston Tea Party, Last night, three cargoes of bohe tea were emptied into the sea. This is the most magnificent moment of all. There is a dignity, a majesty, a sublimity in this last effort of the patriots, which I greatly admire. So I thought that was an interesting side note as well. Now before we pour our tea, let's look at a little bit about the teaware we're using today. And um, once again, we are using Johnson Brothers Ironstone, made in England. And the name of this particular pattern, and I love that. The name of this pattern is Colonial Overhang, Johnson Brothers Ironstone, and Heritage Hall made in England. So here we have basically a colonial home, a colonial scene. I chose this because I think that it looks really great with this coverlet on the table. And this sort of china or ironstone would definitely have been used in the time period. We're also using a lot of copper on the table, which you can see. In fact, some of our smaller guests today are actually using little copper teacups. And our very small guests today are using pewter teacups. Very typical of the period. Now, since we're trying three colonial teas today, three of the teas that were dumped in the, the harbor at the Boston Tea Party, this in this copper reservoir, we are steeping the oolong. And this copper reservoir actually would have been something they would have had in colonial times, except that this one is from 1917, and it actually is electro, has an electric cord that runs from it to keep everything hot. But in the colonial days, there would have been a little, uh, maybe a little alcohol burner down here to keep the water nice and hot, your coffee, your tea, or just your water. So that has the oolong. And then this little copper pot, 
we are going to we are steeping the buhi, which is the black tea. I always love copper and I find it especially wonderful for a colonial tea. Thing about the buhi is it was a mispronunciation of the actual Chinese word. They called it the colonists called it buhi and it became slang for tea. So instead of calling it tea, they called all the tea buhi. Now, if you're doing a colonial tea or a Boston tea party, using copper is really very, very appropriate. Copper or pewter or china, of course, but I'm just really fond of this copper. And this one actually does have a little burner underneath it just to keep the water hot. But that is simply a candle. And in our third copper pot, we are going to simply keep the hot water and I'm going to try that wonderful cacao tea, Martha Washington's favorite tea. I can't wait to try that one. So madam, are you ready to try your oolong tea? This is the Colonial Buhi, Oliver Pluff and Company, black tea blend and lightly smoky. And I can tell you right now that you can really smell that smokiness on that tea. So I'm just going to pour a little cup for us so we can just give this a taste. Wow, that is so smoky. My goodness, it's like there's a campfire. There's actually like... <laughs> We're sitting by a campfire right now. So as this cool tea cools down just a little bit, I want to read you some of the literature that came with this particular tea. Before the Boston Tea Party on December 1st, 1773, the ship London arrived in Charlestown carrying 257 chests of tea. A meeting was called in the Great Hall of the Exchange regarding unconstitutional purposes of raising a revenue up us without our consent. The tea was confiscated and stored in the exchange. No payment of tea taxes was made. Satisfied, the citizens allowed the tea to remain in Charlestown only if locked away. That's just part one. Give this a taste. Wow. Hmm. I'm telling you, all I taste is smoke. But let me continue. Later, on November 1st, 1774, the ship Britannia arrived in Charlestown, captained by Samuel Ball, Jr. of the British East Un India Company. The South Carolina Gazette reported that the minds of the people appeared to be very agitated by the arrival of seven chests of East India tea. An inquiry ensued with a refusal to unload the stowaway tea. Captain Ball did not deny having the mischievous drug on board. In his defense, Captain Ball confessed that his mate had received them in his absence. The tea merchants were then induced to dump the chests overboard into the Cooper River as a sacrifice to Neptune. As the tea was destroyed, many stood on the shore watching and immediately dispersed after the dumping of the tea as if nothing had happened. <laughs> so it was more than a Boston Tea Party. There was also a Charlestown Tea Party, but they didn't dress up like Indians. Hmm. Well, you know, I think for a late afternoon tea, this would be good. But it really, like I said, this really is smoky. It's very smoky. It's pretty strong. And... Honestly, it feels like you're drinking tea sitting by the campfire or <laughs> next to a, a hearth as your bread is toasting. The one I really want to try, though, is Martha Washington's favorite chocolate tea. Typical afternoon tea for a colonist of any rank would be, of course, tea and toast. 
Instead of scones, the colonists liked toast, and they would butter it heavily and toast it over the coals or the fire, and this is just a really dense and firm colonial bread recipe that I found. And then maybe sometimes something a little bit more sweet, and in this case I found this in a recipe uh, called Boston Tea Party, authentic recipes from the col colonial times. And this is called a strawberry cream cheese sandwich. So it's a uh, very thinly sliced sweet brown bread spread with cream cheese topped with a slice of strawberry. And the cream cheese has been mixed with vanilla and a little bit of sugar. And it's actually quite good. Not as good as scones and clotted cream by any stretch of the imagination, but a lot easier to make. And on the oolong tea, as it is very, very light, and mild and smooth, does need a bit of sweetener, and she thinks that it would be best served as an iced tea, and I think I happen to agree with her. So that would be the oolong made by the Solstice Sea Trader. So it's time to try Martha Washington's cacao tea. And we're going to use a little copper infuser. And I'll pour yours first. And we will let that steep for about three to five minutes. As our tea steeps, let's talk about a few of the items here on the table. If you were watching any of the videos back a couple months ago, you will know that we dried flowers that were growing in the garden and they were the purpose was to use them over the winter months to create wreaths and flower arrangements. And this is one of those flower arrangements. I've been doing them several flower arrangements and wreaths to put those wonderful dried flowers to use. I also threw in some peacock feathers, courtesy of the Peabody Boys. Now, if you love copper, copper is pretty much a treasure hunt. You can find copper from many, many different eras. And it's just a fun thing to look for. And copper is just so beautiful. You just have to make sure you keep it shined up because it doesn't look very good when it's tarnished. This lovely lady here that joined us for tea is actually not a doll from the colonial era. She is actually from probably about 1840s. So she's called a griner. And she's drink, drinking out of little copper cups. The coverlet on the table is from 1840, but would have been appropriate for the time period because coverlets have been woven for absolutely centuries. So this pattern really is a very colonial pattern. And what else have we got? Oh, the piece of artwork on the wall. That's one of mine. And um, this is a print called America. And this is a print I did, my goodness, I think back in 2008 I did the original painted paper cutting. This is a framed print, but I also added some paper cut ships down there on the bottom. And if you're interested in that, those are for sale on my website, which I'll link below. And I will also link all the appropriate places where you can find these teas. We began this uh, tea party, we were talking about the tea company, the East India Tea Company, that started my curiosity about colonial tea in the first place. Now, the tea company actually broke up in the mid-1800s, but they regrouped again, and they actually do still exist, and they are based in London. I went to their website, and they did have some colonial teas there, but the price for the shipping was exorbitant, so I chose not to purchase it. But the tea that was dumped in the harbor was very different than the tea that we're used to today. We would have been very disappointed in the tea because it was way past its prime. What would happen is the East India Tea Company, which actually got their tea from China, would be the tea would be brought to the warehouses in London and 
1770 and 1771, it was put in the warehouses and it would sit there for years before actually being shipped to the Americans in 1773. So I think the colonists had a good reason to be angry with King George just for that fact alone. But let's try our tea now. One thing I can clearly um, catch in the air is a wonderful scent of chocolate. Just a faint scent of chocolate, but I definitely think because this is chocolate tea, we really must add some sugar. And if you wish to be elegant and you're a colonist and you are mimicking your British cousins, you do not stir your tea. You move your fork, your spoon back and forth, which prevents the tea from sloshing around in the cup and it also disintegrates that little sugar cube much more quickly. So back and forth, back and forth. I like the color of this tea. I like the scent of it. But I'm not expecting some super deluxe chocolate flavor because after all, this is tea. And it doesn't have all those additives to make it sweet and rich. So, let's give it a try. It's good. I think I would want a little more sweetener. And when I use sweetener or when I serve tea to anyone, I always include many different kinds of sweetener. Most people don't even use real sugar anymore. I'm doing it today to be authentic. But generally, um, I will put on the table available um, packets of Sweet and Low, Splenda, Sugar, and Stevia. And personally, I use Stevia normally in my coffee and tea. But today... We're using what they had back in the colonial times, which is absolutely pure sugar. Now let's see if that gave us a little stronger flavor, because really, don't you think that chocolate should have a little sugar in it? Much better. So what does it taste like? I'll tell you what it tastes like. It tastes like chocolate tea. And that is exactly what it is. <laughs> no wonder Martha Washington liked it. I think it's really good. Now, it's uh, fairly expensive to get this can of tea. It wasn't inexpensive. I think this little can, if I recall correctly, was around $16 just for this little can of tea. But this is worth buying just to have a colonial tea party and because it is so different from any other kind of tea that you're ever going to drink. So I, I recommend this. I recommend that you set your table and have a Boston Tea Party or a Car Charlestown Tea Party or just a Colonial Tea Party. And thank you for joining me again from Hopalong Hollow. This is Jerry. See you later. <laughs>